When my cousin Cody and I were in our early 20s, we went on a handful of camping trips around Colorado. This particular incident occurred when I was 22 and he was 23, deep in the Aral forest. It was my first time camping there, but not Cody's. We often chose to go camping in the middle of the week to avoid traffic and crowds, as our jobs allowed us to have off days then. I always deferred to Cody's expertise on these trips. He's the Eagle Scout, not me. We parked near a picnic area and ventured into the woods. After about 15 minutes of hiking, we found a suitable spot to set up camp. A clearing big enough for two tents, a portable stove, and a campfire. Cody was always quicker than me at pitching a tent. It took him only a few minutes, whereas it typically took me over 20. Once the tents were up, we created a ring of stones for a fire and gathered some wood. Cody had brought fire starter and a lighter, so we didn't have to rely solely on our survival skills. As the sun began to set, we had a fire going and Cody was cooking steak and burgers. He always went all out with the food and being a great cook, I trusted him to feed us well. We kept our bear spray handy Cody assured me that the likelihood of encountering a black bear was low. According to him, the real concern in the wilderness was other people. As we enjoyed our meal and cracked open some beers, classic rock played on the speaker, adding to the ambience. Moments like these, in the wilderness with a friend or family member, are truly special. As darkness fell, we started playing card games on a folding table we had brought specifically for that purpose. After some traditional card games, we switched to Uno. It was during our Uno game that we heard something unsettling in the woods. I paused the music and we listened intently. There was a person humming and footsteps approaching from beyond the trees. In the pitch blackness of the forest, it was unnerving. Cody urged me to find the flashlight, but by the time I located it, the sounds had faded away. We were both shaken, and Cody admitted it was unusual for someone to be so deep in the woods, especially behaving so strangely. We resumed playing cards, but with the music much lower. Suddenly, a big stick landed in the middle of our campsite, making us both jump. It hadn't fallen from a tree. It had been thrown. Cody yelled out, telling whoever was out there to stop messing with us. Then, footsteps could be heard again, moving away from us. I suggested we pack up and move camp, and Cody agreed. Absolutely not going to risk it. In the dark, Cody insisted it was safer to stay put, armed with our bear spray. He advised me to keep it next to me in my tent while we slept, as it was the closest thing to ranged self-defense we had. Throughout the night, we kept hearing unsettling sounds, tree branches cracking in the distance, noises that no animal would make. It was clear that someone, maybe multiple people, were out there. We agreed to take turns staying awake to keep watch over our campsite prevent theft, or worse. Cody took the first watch, reading his book, while I crawled into my tent and settled into my sleeping bag. Waking up in the middle of the night while camping wasn't unusual, but this time felt different. I was groggy, disoriented, and unsure of what had woken me. As I looked up, I saw a figure peering into my tent. Assuming it was Cody waking me for my turn, I mumbled groggily, asking if it was my watch. But the figure swiftly zipped up the tent, and it dawned on me that it wasn't Cody. I felt a surge of alarm and confusion. Hastily, I unzipped my tent to check the campsite, only to find the fire extinguished, and Cody's tent still zipped up fast asleep inside. Panic gripped me as I realized someone else had been watching us. 
I shook Cody awake and told him what had happened. It took him a moment to register the situation, but when he did, he grabbed his bear spray. He suggested I sleep in his tent with him for safety, but I needed my sleeping bag. As we hurriedly retrieved it, the haunting sound of humming echoed through the darkness again, sending shivers down my spine. We huddled together in Cody's tent, clutching our cans of bear spray, yearning for the safety of dawn. The night felt endless as I kept watch while Cody slept fitfully. When dawn finally broke, we wasted no time in packing up and leaving. Despite the temptation to find another campsite, the fear of the unknown kept us on edge. We hurried back to the car, grateful to leave the eerie depths of the forest behind us. This experience left us haunted, and the desire for the safety of our homes overshadowed any lingering interest in camping. Six years have passed since that night, and although my cousin has reached out a few times about camping again, I haven't mustered up the courage since. People can be far scarier than any creature lurking in the woods. The sight of that person's head peering into my tent in the darkness felt like something straight out of a nightmare. It's an experience that may deter me from camping indefinitely. When my friends and I rented a beach house in Florida, I never imagined how unsettling things would become. The four of us crammed into a car and drove down to the house, which sat directly on the beach. The location was idyllic, with the bay in front of the house and the beach in the backyard. Despite the beauty of the setting, there was an eerie sense of isolation. No cars passed by as we unloaded our belongings. The interior of the house was modest but clean, adorned with beach-themed decor. We quickly settled in, each claiming a bedroom. My room boasted a view of the beach, which was the first thing I wanted to explore. The beach was practically deserted, save for an older couple far down the shoreline. After spending a few hours on the beach, we ventured out to eat and explore the town. By the time we returned, darkness had descended. We decided to play football on the beach, fueled by a few drinks. Amidst the game, I noticed something peculiar, a figure standing waist deep in the water. Illuminated by the moon, it was an eerie sight, especially considering the late hour. Curiosity peaked. We moved to the deck and watched from a distance, sipping beers until exhaustion crept in. One by one, my friends retreated inside to sleep, leaving only John and me on the deck. I couldn't shake the image of the figure in the water, casting occasional glances in its direction. Seen anyone lingering around the area, both neighbors claimed they hadn't noticed anything unusual but they did mention that there had been reports of a few break-ins in the area recently. This information only added to our unease. Despite the unsettling events of the previous night, we tried to enjoy the rest of our time at the beach house. However, the feeling of being watched lingered, casting a shadow over our activities. We kept the backyard lights on throughout the night hoping to deter any potential intruders. When it was time to leave, none of us were eager to linger. We packed our belongings quickly and left the beach house behind, relieved to be heading home. The eerie encounters we had experienced left us shaken, and the memory of those nights would haunt us for years to come. It was trying to trick me into going outside I stayed glued to my spot in the kitchen, terrified of what might happen if I left the safety of my home. Eventually, the ringing stopped, and I crept back upstairs to my room, locking the door behind me. I didn't sleep a wink that night, my mind racing with fear and confusion. The next morning, I cautiously ventured downstairs relieved to find everything as it should be. 
I never mentioned the incident to my mom, afraid she would dismiss it as childish imagination. But the memory of that night haunted me for years, leaving me with a deep-seated fear of being alone at home. Reflecting on these experiences, I realize how vulnerable we can be, even in the safety of our own homes. Whether it's the eerie encounters in the wilderness, or the chilling phone call from someone claiming to be my deceased father, these moments serve as stark reminders of the unpredictability of life and the importance of staying vigilant in the face of danger. I had her phone, then things took a turn for the worse when there were knocks at the front door. This went from a someone has my mom's phone situation to a someone is outside the house situation. My mom would not be knocking on the door. She'd have a key, obviously. I peered around the wall of the kitchen to look at the front door. I heard a man's muffled voice on the other side saying my name. He was saying, it's your dad. He rang the doorbell and then I heard him start attempting to open the door. I did something that no nine-year-old should ever have to do, and that was grabbing the phone and calling 911. The 911 operator asked me what I imagined to be some pretty standard questions. Most importantly, telling me to wait in a bathroom or other room with a lockable door until the police get there. The bathroom is on the first floor of the house. I hid in there with the lights off. Whoever was outside came to the window and tried pulling it open. I heard their entire struggle. Then they must have moved to the next window. I think they tried every window and door in the house. If anything were to have been unlocked, this story would have had a very different outcome. If anything were to have been unlocked, this story would have had a very different outcome. They must have given up at some point before the police arrived. And I say they, because clearly there were two people involved in this, a man and a woman. They both could have been out there for all I know. The operator told me that the police were at the front door now and it was safe to go meet them there. Only when I opened the door to the police was when I hung up the phone. They did a quick investigation inside and outside of the house and asked me where my mom was supposed to be, and if my mom knew anyone who might want to hurt us. I'm sure I said I thought she was grocery shopping or something, and not that I know of. My mom returned home with my little sister in a panic when she saw the police cars out front. My mom's phone was stolen, which was already clear. I'm sure that our address, home phone number, and other personal information were stored somewhere on the phone, easily accessible. Though how they knew my name, I'm not exactly sure. Something on my mom's phone must have given it away. It was an old Nokia flip phone. Who stole it was a mystery, but my mom's phone background was a picture of her with my little sister and me. This could have been an indication to some disgusting, creepy couple out there that the owner of this phone was a single mom with two young kids. And they tried to use that as a way of tricking me into leaving the house, which is absolutely disgusting and horrific. The phone must have been destroyed after the failed attempts at trying to lure me outside. Things were a little different after this. My mom wouldn't leave me alone anymore at night. Not until I was a few years older at least. As the events unfolded, the chilling reality of the situation lingered long after the incident. The sense of vulnerability and fear left an indelible mark on our lives. Yet, through vigilance and support, we found strength in each other. My mom's unwavering protection became a beacon of safety in the night, a testament to the resilience of family bonds. Though the perpetrators remained elusive, their nefarious intentions serve as a stark reminder 
of the dangers that lurk in the shadows. But in the face of adversity, we emerged with heightened awareness and a renewed commitment to our safety. As time passed, the scars of that harrowing night faded, replaced by a newfound sense of security and unity. And while the memory may still send shivers down our spines, it also serves as a testament to our ability to overcome even the darkest of threats.